ask you to turn with us to Matthew 13. Uh, we're going to look at these parables for a few weeks today, the parable of the sower. Uh, if you'll go ahead and turn to Matthew 13, please. Mark Washington uh, tells that his grandfather was a Mississippi farmer. He farmed the red clay of Mississippi for years and years. And uh, his grandfather died when he was a sophomore in college. And that summer when Mark went home, uh, one of his uncles asked <coughs> excuse me, Mark if he would uh, come and help him spruce up his grandfather's grave. And so they drove the mile-long driveway down to the farm, and they backed a pickup truck up to the barn, and you know what they loaded on that barn. They loaded uh, some manure and soil out of those stalls where cows and horses had been for years. And many, many people had backed up to that barn over the years and gotten that manure and that soil. And uh, so Mark and his uncle did. And then they went to a garden shop and bought sod. And then they headed to the cemetery. And they uh, took that manure and that soil and mixed it in with that red clay. And then once that was done, they put that sod on top of that. And then they watered it real good. And guess what? They had the best-looking grave site in that cemetery. It turned a lush green, stayed that way for years. And Mark makes this point. Any farmer or gardener worth his tomatoes knows the importance of what? Of good soil. You can have the best seed. You can have perfect conditions, sun and rain. But if you don't have good soil, you've got a problem. If you want to produce a crop, it's so important that we have good soil. Uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to look at Jesus' parables about soil and weeds and seed. And I uh, thought for springtime, and of course it feels like winter this morning, right? Uh, but we're going to look at these parables over these next few weeks. Today, the parable of the sower, if you'll turn with me to Matthew 13. Some of the seed fell along the path. Uh, verse thir uh, chapter 13 of Matthew, verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Now, please understand uh, the, the scene in Palestine, biblical days. Uh, the farmer would have been sowing seed along long furrows with paths, walking paths alongside. You and I think of a garden or a farm, we see this big field or big expanse. But in that day and time, how did people travel? Everybody walked, or they rode on an animal. So you had all these paths. The farmer did not want people walking across his garden, across his furrows. And so alongside these furrows were these walking paths. They were as hard as concrete because people traveled them all the time. And so when the farmer started sowing seeds, the birds were so excited because they knew that seed was going to fall on the paths. They were going to have a picnic. They were going to have a feast. It was a good day for the birds. And they came along and snatched up those seeds. Well, Jesus' point is that there are people who uh, perhaps hear the word, the gospel, about the kingdom of God, but they do not understand. And so... Satan comes along and snatches up those seeds. Now, who would those people be today? Well, some of them might be what we hear about as the nuns, the millennials, who today say they have no religious affiliation, and that part of our population is growing, we're told. Uh, they don't even think about God. They don't even think about the church. Or maybe it would be those who occasionally hear about God and the gospel, the love of God, but it just bounces off. It's like that hard path that just bounces off. Or maybe it's those that are just stubborn. Or maybe it's those that are hard-hearted 
and hard-headed. You know anybody like that? Maybe it's those that are arrogant and prideful. But some of the seed fell on the hard path, and Satan came and snatched it up. Um, my guess is, let's just be honest this morning. My guess is that all of us have a little bit of this in us, that all of us are a little bit hard-hearted and hard-headed at times. Would anybody agree with that? Uh, my guess is that describes everybody in this room at times. One, in fact, one of you sent me this story I enjoyed about the two little boys that went down to the cemetery. And the city cemetery was enclosed with the fence. And inside the fence, there was this pecan tree. And it was a good year for pecans. And uh, the two little boys took their buckets, went inside the fence, sat down, and began dividing up the pecans. One for you, one for me, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. And some of the pecans missed their buckets, rolled down to the fence. Well, another little boy comes down the street on his bicycle. He hears some talking from the cemetery. He looks in, doesn't see anybody, but he hears this, one for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. And so he decided in his mind that the Lord and Satan were dividing up the souls. Scared him to death, so he takes off toward town to get some help. Runs into this old man on a cane. He said, you've got to come. The old man said, that's ridiculous. That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. But the little boy insisted, so the old man goes down, and they both look into the fence. They're going to see if they can see God. Can't see anybody, but they hear this, one for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. And then those voices say, we've counted everything here and here, but the ones that roll down to the fence... Let's get them and we'll be done. <laughs> the story has it that that old man beat that little boy back to town five minutes. Scared him to death. Aren't all of us hard nuts to crack sometimes? Let's just be honest. A little hard-hearted, a little hard-headed. And maybe that's what Jesus is talking about. The seed hits the pass, and Satan comes and snatches it up. Some of the seed fell among the rocks. Look at verse 5 of the text, Matthew 13. Uh, some, some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. Now, when I go out to work in my garden, I deal with rocks. I don't like it, but I do. That's not what it's talking about. In Palestine... There was a thin layer, many places, a thin layer of good soil underneath a limestone plate. The farmer sowed his seed. He couldn't see that limestone plate, of course. So he sowed his seed. What happened? Good soil on top. Seed germinates. Roots go down. Plant springs up. Farmer goes out and says, wow, this is a good year. This is fantastic. Sun comes out for a couple of days. Farmer goes back and checks. Everything's withered. Why? Because the roots had no place to go. They couldn't get water. They couldn't get nourishment. They couldn't get nutrients. And so those plants that sprang up withered as quickly. Doesn't the same thing happen with Christians and in the church? We see people receive Christ, profess faith. They're baptized. They're excited and what? We don't see them anymore. Or we see people receive Christ, profess faith, baptize, or excited, testing comes, and they're gone. Or we see people receive Christ, profess faith, baptize, they're very excited, and then they become complacent and indifferent. And we wonder, where are they? What happened to them? Read the parable of the sower. Jesus told us 2,000 years ago what happened to him. Our church roles today, unfortunately, are filled with these people that Jesus is talking about, where the seed fell among the rocks. Um, another funny story I heard about the preacher that preached about 10 minutes one Sunday. I've been going about 10 minutes, right? Almost. And he quit. You know, he quit. Uh, usually preached longer than that. Preached about 10, 12 minutes, and he finished his sermon. He gave the invitation. 
uh, finished that up, and then he said this. He said, my dog is fond of eating paper, and he ate the half of my sermon I didn't preach. He gave the benediction and went out to the lobby. There was a visitor to the church that Sunday. Visitor to that church that Sunday went to the preacher and said, I'll tell you what, preacher. If that dog of yours has any pups, I want to get one and give it to my preacher. <laughs> now, I like that story, but here's the deal. There are an awful lot of Christians who get just enough religion to soothe their souls and their consciences, and then they're out of here. True? They get just enough preaching, just enough teaching, just enough of this mu music to make them feel okay. You go look at our church roll. Is that too hard this morning? Some of the seed fell on the path. Some of it fell on rocky places, and some of it fell among the thorns. Look at verse 7, Matthew 13. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Now, here what we have to understand, this was good soil. But good soil will do what? If you're a gardener or a farmer, you know this. Good soil will grow what? It'll grow good stuff, and it'll grow weeds. And if you're a gardener or a farmer, you know that you have to be diligent, disciplined in fighting weeds or what? They'll take over, right? Good soil can grow corn, but it can also grow what? Thank you. Good soil can grow barley, but it can grow what? Good soil can grow rye or wheat or oats or whatever, but it will grow weeds because the seeds from the weeds is in the soil, the fibrous roots are in the soil, and it can grow weeds as well. We see people profess faith in Christ, follow Christ, they're baptized, they're excited, they're joyful, it's great. And then the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of riches, what? Choke it out. We see people profess faith, follow Christ, baptized. Be careful. And then we get busy. You say, preacher, you just don't understand. We're busy people. We got to work. We got to go to school. We got to do extracurricular activities. We got this this weekend, this that weekend, this next weekend. And what happens? The demands of this life become so important they take over. Let's just be honest. Go look the church roll again, and you'll see example after example where that has happened. The demands of this life take over. Hey, this book right here says God is a jealous God. He wants first place. He will not settle for second place or third or fourth. And that's where we try to put him. We relegate him to that too many times. He says, no, I'm a jealous God. I want to be your Lord. Not just your Savior, but your Lord. Lord of all. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, everybody in here knows that name, wrote a book called Stress Fractures. He tells about a time in his life, in his ministry, when he was so busy that it was affecting his marriage and his family and his health. He said one night his family is eating dinner together. It didn't happen very often, but they're eating dinner together. And his little girl, Colleen, looked up at him and said, Daddy, Something really special happened to me at school today. I want to tell you about it, and I'll tell you fast. And Chuck Swindoll said it hit him just like that. And said he looked at her and said, Honey, you tell me what happened at school today, but you don't have to tell me fast. You talk slowly. And you know what she said to him? She said, Daddy, then you listen slowly. You listen slowly. Another little girl went to her mama. Her mama's sitting in front of a computer screen. We all do that today, don't we? And what do we do? Let's just be honest, parents and grandparents in the room. We're looking at that computer screen. We're looking at a laptop. We're looking at the phone. And our child or our grandchild standing right here. And we're doing this number all the time. 
That little girl said, Mama, I don't feel like you're listening to me. I don't feel like you hear me. And it hit that mama like a ton of bricks. And she turned to her little girl and she said, Honey, it will never happen again. When you need me, when you want to talk to me, you will have my attention. You see, Jesus said that some of the seed falls among the thorns. The worries of this life, read the entire chapter, the deceitfulness of riches, the things of this world, choke out the things of God and what's most important. And so some of the seed fell on the rocks and among the thorns and along the path, but we can't end there. The good news is this. Look at verse 8, please. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown, and he who has ears, let him hear. Wow. Don't you know that farmer was excited? Hey, in Palestine, biblical times, if a farmer had planted a crop and got a tenfold increase, he had been excited. Jesus said some of the seed fell on good soil and produced 30 and 60 and 100 times. Wow! Can you imagine if you're a farmer and you have that kind of production, what that means? So watch Jesus say. He says, we hear the word, we understand the word, and then we bear fruit. Got it? What if all of us hear the word, understand it, and go tell somebody this week about the love of Christ? Go share the gospel this week. We're bold in our witness this week. We invite somebody to our Sunday school class this week. We invite somebody to our children's ministry, our youth ministry this week, or to have dinner with us Wednesday night. What if all of us left this place this morning so excited because we're going to bear fruit. We're going to bear a crop. That's good soul. When we get to the point where we hear the word, we understand the word of God, and we bear fruit. We bear a crop. And Jesus says, God can do things in you and me that we never imagined. 30, 60, or 100 fold. Wow. Hey, uh, we've had the Hurley boys at our house all week. Ashley's boys, our oldest daughter. Hayden is five. Sawyer's three. Uh, Maddox is 18 months. Uh, they're going home today. Uh, they're going to be at church in just a minute. Um, and, and we're so proud of these grandsons, as I told you about the Rogersons last week. Um, there, there's one thing that Hayden and Sawyer cannot do. I've, I've told their mom and daddy this, so I'm not telling you anything that I've not said to Ashley and to Brandon. been very honest with them. Hayden and Sawyer cannot not talk, okay? They cannot not talk. They have a lot to talk about. They have a lot to tell you. They talk all day long and into the night, and they see each other all the time, but they have a lot to tell each other. They will not hush at night, okay? One night this week... We took away the stuffed toys. We took away the nightlight. Gigi spanked her bottoms one time each. We separated them. We bribed them. Finally, they went to sleep. But I want to tell you this. They're going to walk through that door in, this, in just a minute. They're going to jump up in my arms. They are the lovingest little boys, just like your children. They'll crawl up in your lap, they'll put their arms around your neck, and they'll say, I love you, and they'll kiss you, and they'll say, I'm going to miss you. Every morning this week, I beat them up. I make sure I beat them. I, I don't beat them up. I get up before they do. Wrong choice of words, right? I don't beat them up. Don't go out here saying that. That didn't come out right, did it? I get up before they do. They come in the den, they crawl up in my lap, and they say, can we read some books? We've read two or three books every morning. It's been such a special time. Then they get down and want to play. And Sawyer, the three-year-old, has shown us all week how Jesus died on the cross. And he bleated. But in church last Sunday, Boppy, it, it, it wasn't real bleated. But Jesus really bleated. 
Here's my point. My guess is, in your children and mine, your grandchildren and mine, and everybody in here, there's some hard path. In all of our lives, there's some rocks. In all of our lives, there's some thorns. But in every one of our lives, in all of our children and grandchildren, there's good soul. Hey, folks. Because we're all made in God's image, and we're his children, and there's good soul. And if we pray, and we seek the Spirit of God, God will do things we can't even imagine. And that's my prayer for the Hurley boys and the Rogerson boys and your children and grandchildren. And God's at work, I have no doubt. And we keep sowing and we keep praying. Let me close with this story real quick. Steve Farrar wrote a book called Finishing Strong. Told about a pastor in Houston many years ago who was so excited about being a preacher. He was on fire for the Lord and he was also excited about others who were on fire for the Lord. And in the front cover of his Bible, he wrote about three or four dozen names of people that he knew that were on fire for the Lord. But he noticed something over the years. He noticed over the years that some of those people listed in the front of his Bible had become complacent or indifferent or they'd grown cold. And so after a while, he started marking off their names. Three or four dozen people in the front of his Bible started marking off their names. These were people at one time on fire for the Lord. And when this pastor got to be in his 80s, there were only three names in the front of his Bible that he had not crossed off. Three names. Folks, we want to be good soul. And through prayer and through the Word, cultivating that soul every single day and seeing what God might do in our lives, in our homes, in our families, and in our church. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, how thankful we are uh, for good soil, and we want to be good soil, Lord, everybody in here. And we just ask this morning that your Holy Spirit working us and stir us and move in us and grow us and make us fruit-bearing Christians. Uh, Lord, help us not to, to settle for anything else, but to be on fire for you and be excited for you and passionate about you and be fruit-bearing Christians. Lord, if there's anybody here who's never received you for the first time, we pray today will be the day that they'll be excited about Jesus, that they'll be a follower of Jesus, and that they'll be a fruit-bearing Christian as well. Right now, give us the courage to respond as we need to, and we make this our prayer in your name. Amen. We're going to sing a